Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. Phil does a two-minute segment with us each weekday morning at 6.38 about the markets. Good morning, Phil. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We are well, Phil, and yourself. Having a dream. Hey, man, it was a uh, a really bad Saturday for Steeler fans. <laughs> it's been a really bad month <laughs> that was bad, for man. Steeler fans, but... You know, it was. It's kind of when I watched the game, and I, I had to watch it a little bit on delay. But um, the saddest thing, well, number one, I wasn't surprised. It's kind of what I expected, but which is sad. And but the second part is, is the national media isn't surprised. You don't even hear them talking about it. So uh, uh, still a proud franchise to to just get pummeled the way that they have in the last three weeks, and seemingly kind of quit. Uh, in a way, so it's almost as if they've given up. So I, I'm I'm going along to your side of things, and I, I think it's time, maybe for Mike Tomlin to move on. He'll always hold a a dear place in my heart, but it, I think it's time for him to move on and him to find new leadership and and start start fresh. Because this man, I'm telling you, that was a tired, uninspired performance the last three weeks, not just last week, but the last three weeks. When they had everything in front of them, they just completely have laid down. That is a uh, an apt way of describing what's going on there, man. That's that's when when the players quit on the field, it's time to change things up, man. Well, we see that, and it, with, and it did appear so. Yeah, we saw that with Buffalo Bills. They started the season just abysmal, and they changed their offensive coordinator. And look what they did yesterday to the Cowboys. An exciting team to watch. They uh, they really put one yeah. on the Cowboys, didn't they? Right, yeah. Bill. Yes, they did. Let's and talk. Uh, let's talk money a little bit here, right? Because we are a, a week from Christmas. It, we are set to close this year with some serious gains. And it should be a positive year, barring something unforeseen. Would you say that's a fair assessment? It would, should be. It would be a complete and utter meltdown if we didn't finish positive. It has been a really, really good year, where we have captured everything that we had was down in the stock market or the equity market. Uh, in 2023, we regained what we had lost in 2022. Now, the bond side—if you look at your portfolio, saying, "Well, heck, I'm not back to where I was." Uh, at the beginning of 2022, that would be due to the bond situation where bonds struggled really, really bad in 22. And they're starting to pick up now, but they're not quite back to where they were before due to that increase in interest rates. But the horizon looks really bright for bonds, assuming that uh, rates start to come down in 2024, especially if they do three or maybe even four decreases of up to a percent in 24. And that will be all data driven, you know, back to Bill's alf- alphabet soup of reports, the CPI and the PPI and the PCE. That narrative is still the same. The outcome with our markets in 23 wasn't the same in 22, but it is the same thing that's driving it. And that is our economy and the jobs report and what the Federal Reserve does in reaction to. And now it looks like it's heading in, it's heading steeply in the direction that they want it to. So, therefore, those rate cuts are on the horizon, and that's what has been our bump. That's where it has given us this lift in the past seven weeks, and, and I think it's been seven consecutive weeks of positive markets, and that's the first time since 2017, I do believe. So it's been a really good fourth quarter, but all based off of the same narrative as what we struggled with in 22 and in parts of 23 as well, uh, but it's just going in the other direction. So it has been positive. Hopefully that can continue on. And, of course, we're going to focus on this PCE re, uh, report that comes out this week. Uh, we should have the results of that already because of the CPI and the PPI that we've already gotten that started, started to kick off uh, this, this run that we've had. But if there's any surprises there, that would move our markets. But all of those reports, wash, rinse, and repeat, that's what we're going to be focused on in 24 as well. The F, former FDI, I talked to you about this at 638, the former FDIC chair, Sheila Baer, said the Fed is sparking irrational market optimism over potential rate cuts, Phil. Do you believe that? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, because I don't think it's irrational, and I still think in defending the Federal Reserve that they've done a good job of not being overly uh, – critical of what, where the where the inflation uh, the pace of inflation or overly optimistic which would cause an irrational bump in our market so to, to me it's not irrational it's just reading the data 
that's in front of them and then reacting off of it, which they haven't reacted yet. They just opened the door to these potential rate cuts in 24, but they're just reading data, and, and that's all they've done all the while is read data and try to react off of it. But if you ask 100 economists, you're going to get a 51-49 split on what they should do. You've got a lot that think that they should have already started cutting rates. You have some that think that they should still be increasing rates. So it's all it's really all over the place. But the proof would be in the pudding when this is all said and done. Can we, at the end of the day, can we avoid a recession? And if we go in recession, how long does it last? And it's not, I don't think the Federal Reserve loses if we go into a recession if it's short-lived. If it's a short-lived recession, I still think they've won. If it's a soft landing, they've won an astounding victory in, in pulling us out of this without going into a deep recession or any recession at all. But the proof would be in the pudding. But no, I think that uh, I don't like the word irrational because all they're doing is reading reading reports and reacting off of it. A year ago, Phil, over well over 50 percent of the economists said we're going to be going into recession. Uh, and now all the talk is if we do go into recession, it's going to be a very it's going to be a soft landing. When do we give up the talk of uh, that we're going to recession and acknowledge the fact that the Federal Reserve did a pretty good job? Um, I think that would be once we get to the the two percent inflation and the jobs market hasn't struggled too much. And it's that is really a tightrope because we talk about that quite often about the job market and the and the rate of uh, wage inflation and so forth where we want to see some softness but not so much that it's going to send us in a recession. So the pace of the economy slowing down is really, really important. While we want to see it slow, we don't want it to be too drastic before the Federal Reserve reacts. They have to remember, when they start talking about rate cuts, it's going to take about three to six months before any rate increase or rate cut, cut makes its way through our economy. So they have to kind of they have to predict, you know, they have to start tapping that uh, brake and putting their foot on the gas, kind of per se, uh, well in advance. So they're they're prognosticating where the economy will go. But once the inflation rate gets down to two percent, and and it, could we dare be afraid that we get into a deflation scenario where it goes too far, where the uh, we've gone down below two percent. And that's when we'd really start to be fearful of a recession. But probably at the end of 24, where we could say, hey, look, we're not going into a recession based off of the unwinding of the COVID easing. Yeah. By the way, Bill and I yeah. disagree on the Fed. I know we do. I, and, if John, and I can say that because John Gilstrap's not here, because you and John are in league He's teamed on up on, on you there. <laughs> right. yeah. it's, it's easy to go, at, oh, they're I, doing a great job I, because I, the market's better now, Bill. And the economy's better now. I, I, I was taking advantage of the attendance around the table this morning. I, you only get that for another 10 minutes, mister. <laughs> hey, Phil. You, Rob is hard. Rob is hard on the Federal Reserve. <laughs> he's, he's always been hard. I hold him to a high standard, <laughs> Philip. You mentioned the, the 2%. Uh, uh, Phil, is that a mythical number? Is that an aspirational number? Or is that a number ground in history? No, it's a number he picked out of a hat. And that's he's just what, happy that's with what 2%. I'm thinking of. That's what I'm thinking Here of. We exactly. go. Yeah. Here we go. No, it's, it's really not. And John Gilstrap and I both agreed, uh, I guess it was about four or five months ago, where we were hopeful that it was kind of, this is hey, this is a target, but we're willing to slow down before we get to that target. And then no sooner than John and I talked about it on a Monday did uh, Jerome Powell come out and reiterate that we mean, when we say 2%, we mean 2%. And he hasn't come off of it. So I think it's ground in that that's exactly where they're trying to get to. And they're not going to, until they can see a clear path to to that 2%, I don't think they're going to decrease rates until that path is very clear. Now, they'll have to decrease rates probably before we get to the two percent that just because of how long it takes its way to work its way through the economy but it could be a bumpy ride you know dare we say that they cut rates a few times and then have to hold them steady for a long time or god forbid they increase them yet again it could be a very bumpy ride to that two percent as they tweak it uh trying to land exactly on that but i do think that, that they are solid on that number and they're they're not coming off of it. We're also we're also implying Phil that Jerome Powell listens to the Monday Talk Radio oh, and listens sure. to you and uh, Gilstrap. Hundred percent. If he would, if he listened to 
Rob, then he would probably have resigned by now. Rob's been hard on that man. Well, it, it's <laughs> when the resigned. when the admiral was captain in his ship, and he saw an island up ahead. He said, "Folks, we're going to stop the ship up at the island." You don't you don't hit the brakes when you get to the island. You got to hit the brakes long before the island. You don't just stop a ship like you stop a car. <laughs> what, have I told you about my San Francisco <laughs> bad idea, Captain? <laughs> unless you're unless you're docking in San Francisco at the wharf, you stop the ship early. If you're in San Francisco at the wharf, you plow through it. I That's guess. right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil, there are some changes Congress has made to the way we save and access retirement funds. More changes kick oh, yeah. in in 2024. Uh, do you uh, have those uh, handy, by the way, to know which uh, which further effects trickle into 24? There's a lot, and we could do an, an hour-long show on Secure Act 2.0 and, and all that's going to be available and some of the changes, but the ones that we're focused on the most is Roth, and it seems like the Rothification, if you will, and, you, and, and everyone knows that we're big on Roth dollars in retirement accounts and any way that you can get it in there just because of the tax-free growth. But in the workplace plans, what they have done is, and it's kind of, it, it's almost as if it's a chain reaction, Is and I'll start with, and if you're over the age of 50 and you're making catch-up contributions to a 401k and your income exceeds, and don't hold me to this, but I think it's $140,000, then those catch-up contributions must go to Roth. You have no option to defer taxes on those catch-up contributions. Well, that sounds like it's not that big of a deal. It's like, well, how many people are actually making catch-up contributions? And on top of that, how many of those people that are making catch-up contributions make over $140,000? That's probably a small percentage of our workforce, which I wouldn't disagree, however, but what that also says is now that every plan that has someone over the age of 50 now must have a Roth option. So those Roth options are going to be much more prevalent than what they were before. Another part of Secure Act 2.0 that I love so much is that now eventually, and it's going to take plans a while to catch up with it, but if your plan elects to do so, you can make your employer's contributions go to the Roth side as well and go ahead and accept that imputed income. Even though you're not seeing it on your paycheck, you can have those contributions go to Roth as well and then stuff more money over on that tax-free growth side of your portfolio. And, as, again, we're, we're big proponents of that in most situations. But So there's there's been a lot of things that's opened up. And then we talk about required minimum distributions, which everybody at some point hopefully has to run into. But these required minimum distributions, if you recall back before the first SECURE Act, it was that strange age of 70 and a half when you had to start taking money out of your tax-deferred accounts of these dollars that you hadn't paid tax on. The IRS now says, hey, we want some of our money, some of our tax dollars. So the first SECURE Act pushed that age out to 72, and then SECURE Act 2.0 has now pushed it out to 73 for people that's going to be 73 before 2033. That gets a little confusing. But if you're not going to be 73 by 2033, then your age is now 75 before you have to start taking those dollars out. So it's extending that required distribution age out, which allows you a little bit more flexibility in our eyes as financial planners to either accept that income or do Roth conversions if you're in a preferred tax bracket. So the SECURE Act 2.0 that will trickle through because there's been a lot of changes and you have to you have to have these plans be able to catch up with these changes and work out any additional kinks that they may bring about. But the Rothification that we've seen in 401k plans, we're big, big fans of Secure Act 2.0, much more than the original Secure Act, simply because it's making uh, Roth dollars more prevalent, and we really like that ability for our clients. And the thing to remember about uh, having your employer contributions go to your Roth, Phil, as you mentioned, is you will now be taxed on that contribution as income, so you're going to have to pay that income tax yes. now, even though you don't actually have that money as income right now. Yes, and you know that's, for some people that's a confusing concept, but if your income is 100000 just for simple, simple math, and your employer's making a 4% contribution for you, and you say, hey, I want that to go to the Roth side, I'll go ahead and pay taxes on it now so I don't have to pay taxes on it in retirement along with its growth. Well, when you go to do your taxes, it's going to look as if you made 104000 even though you really didn't. 
to that 4,000 that they put on the raw side. And in most cases, again, you want to talk to uh, your, t- your CPA or your financial planner about doing so and adjust for any differences in taxes. But, but we are fans of that in most cases, not every case, but in most cases. And the ability and the flexibility of employees to do that to us is really important. And it opens up a lot of windows uh, for 401ks, and it's almost as if it's a chain reaction. It's like, well, if you're allowing, if you're mandating this, then, then it mu- your plan must have that. And it's just a chain reaction, and all of them are kind of centered around uh, Roth dollars and 401ks and the like. So big, big fans of that, at least the flexibility, even if you're not using it, the flexibility to be able to do that. But you do need to talk to someone uh, before you do that because your taxes are going to change a bit. And they'll be, they should be better in retirement, but your taxes are going to change a bit for now while you're still working and putting money away. And uh, Phil, in regards to taking those distributions, if you delay them to 73 or 75, depending on when you were born. I guess the thing to remember on that is you'll be you'll be taking larger distributions because the life expectancy tables by the IRS don't change regardless of what age you start taking those distributions. Correct? Yes, you'll you'll be taken as a percentage. Well, the, the life the the life expectancy does change. It goes de- yes. Uh, so you will be taking larger distributions as a percentage. However, and, and that's what it allows for is for those few extra years for you to to make changes, Roth conversions or accepting income before they force you into it. Uh, so that, that that does allow for some of that before those actually begin. And we start talking about qualified charitable distributions at age 70 and a half and the like to kind of reduce uh, the amount that you must take out, or we should say not to reduce the amount that you have to take out, although it will. We want to reduce the taxes on it. That's the end goal. We want to reduce taxes for you, and if it's going to, if you're going to be given a few more years in, in order before you must take dollars out, that just allows for additional flexibility. Phil, one of our uh, chat room contributors said, "Is there a time limit on how long a Roth must be in place before you retire to enjoy to enjoy the full benefits of the option?" Yes, and for Roth dollars. You have two requirements, and now we're talking about growth on Roth dollars. So if I put $1,000, whether it's in a Roth 401K or a Roth IRA, I've already paid taxes on that. So that $1,000 basis is always available to me tax-free. And another beauty about Roth is it works in as a first-in, first-out basis. So my ba- my basis is what I put into it, correct? So that $1,000 is always available. It may not be the best idea to, to tap it. But that $1,000 that I put in is always available to me free of any penalty or taxes. It's the growth that we're trying to protect. And the rules on the growth is that must the growth must be there for five years or age 50 and, I'm sorry, not or, but and age 59 and a half before you can utilize it tax-free. But you do have that basis that you put in. Uh, so those two requirements, five years and 59 and a half. So if you start putting money in at age 60, that's something else about Secure Act is it increases how much you can put in on a, in a 401k from age 61, 62, 63, I think, are the three ages. Don't hold me to that either without looking at it right in front of me. But the, uh, the Roth dollars uh, the, for the growth, 59 and a half and five years. Phil? There I am. Phil, this is our last show of the calendar year. Because uh, next Monday is Christmas Day, and then the Monday after that is New Year's Day. So we won't be joining with you until after New Year's. Your thoughts on this last year in regards to the market and the economy? Uh, well, it just it kind of goes to show that I think at the beginning of the year when everything started to fall down uh, in regards to the market and everybody saw a bleak outlook, and for the most part, 2023 has been one of those terrific years that we'll look back on and say, yes, this is why we stay the course even after we've had terrible years like 2022 was. This is why we stay the course because of this potential. And it it will be a focus as much as 2020 has been, 2018, we go all the way back to 2009, 2010. This will be one of those years that we point at and say, this is why you stay the course and you don't panic. Uh, but it has been a terrific year. As far as the economy goes, 
it really doesn't look that much different than it did at the beginning of the year, just a little bit softer. You know, inflation has come down a little bit. Uh, some of our economic uh, guidelines or reports that the, the alphabet soup, as Bill would say, looks a little bit softer, but that's what the Federal Reserve was looking for. So it still looks like a fairly strong economy that is slowing down. The the one thing that we'll look for in 2024 is that hopefully it doesn't slow down so much that we're in a recession and that the Federal Reserve can decrease rates as they have laid out, maybe even more so, that would lift our markets even more. Phil, uh, you interpreted Rob's question to be toward the economics. I interpret his question to be uh, in regard to the uh, guest co-host. <laughs> and you're supposed to say, what a great year that was. <laughs> it was It was a great year. And, it, it, for, and all, all the way around except for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Everything looks really good for 23 except for the Pittsburgh Steelers. But maybe it's a catalyst to a new coach new quarterback and, and some and more victories for the Steelers that lie ahead. Phil, have a great day, sir. How do people reach you for more information? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Merry Christmas, Phil. Thank you, Philip. Merry Christmas, guys. Appreciate it.